to what you have to share. Well, good morning, and thank you, Hank, for those song selections. I, I suspect you may have read the passage before, before I do today, but uh, no, those, the, all those songs had many elements of what I want to talk about today, but as, uh, as I was preparing last night, uh, Hannah came down and was sitting beside me, and she was coloring, and she said, Dad, whenever you're ready to practice, she said, I'm going to gather all my stuffed animals together. <laughs> and I'm going to sit down and, and I'll keep coloring. You, you can just speak and it'll be like you're talking to you on Sunday. And uh, I told her that that was probably more intimidating than being up here. <laughs> But uh, we are in the book of Ephesians. If you haven't been with us, Andy spoke the first two messages on chapter 1 of Ephesians. But today we're going to go into chapter 2, the first 10 verses. And uh, the book of Ephesians, a rough outline that we have been using a little bit is that the first three chapters are mainly doctrinal. Uh, doctrine, doctrine is a set of beliefs. And the, the last three chapters, 4 to 6, are mainly practical in, in what they teach. But uh, Andy was reminding us in his messages that doctrine is extremely practical for us um, because our, de our doctrine determines what we do. Um, so if you, if you believe these things, um, it, it will determine how, how you live. And uh, these, these are truths that we can take to heart and with Christ living in us, these truths come out and dictate how we live. But uh, so Andy posed the question to us, believer, do you know who you are in Christ? The first part of chapter one, Paul reminds the believers of all the riches that they have in Christ. And as we, as I listened to Andy's message, I was, and I heard feedback from others as well, they're greatly encouraged to just be reminded of all the things that we have in Christ maybe on a higher level or, or above what we normally think of or just how great um, a blessing it is, um, more than we could ever ask for, for or need. But he also reminded us that these truths are as good on the bad days as, as the good days. These things have always been, in, been true, um, but our enjoyment of them perhaps uh, varies a little bit from person to person. But as we're preparing for this Ephesians study uh, last week. Uh, we were praying around the, the circle and that was the prayer that these things in this book would come alive in the lives and hearts of people here that we can uh, be encouraged um, to see what, what God has done for us through, through his son. And that's what Paul does in, in the last part of chapter one. He prays for them. Uh, that's what we looked at last week, this prayer. He prays that uh, for their knowledge of him, that their, the eyes of their hearts would be enlightened, that they would have a real and fruitful experience of God. And in a sense, he's praying home the, the doctrine that he had, he had preached to them in the, in the first part. And right at the end of chapter 1, Andy left us with this. There's a, there's a mention of church. It says, and he put all things... This is Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And this is almost just a, he slips this word church in there. It's almost a sneak peek of, of where we're headed. But, uh, but before, before we get to the church, Chapter 2 is broken down in these two sections. Verse 1 to 10 is about new life individually. And, chap and verse 11 to 22 is about new life corporately. Um, because we recognize that the church, before we talk about church, the church is made up of individuals. And Paul wants to look at individuals' lives and see what, um, and, and take a look at that. 
Um, so this, in a sense, is, a, is an opportunity to consider or to think about yourself. Where, where are you at? Um, Paul here is almost writing to the Ephesian believers a spiritual biography um, of them. A biography is an account of someone's life written by someone else. But this can be true for, for us as well. To the believer, Paul here is writing out your biography. This is the story of your life. Where you were in the past tense when you were outside of Christ, and now where you are in the present tense, now that you are in Christ, to the believer. This is a portrait of what every unsaved man is and what every saved person was before trusting Christ. This morning is an opportunity to look at your own spiritual story. And whether Andy realized this or not, but he's setting a strong tradition to stand as we, as we read this passage together. So let's, uh, I don't want to break tradition, so let's, let's stand and read. <clears throat> so Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love which, with, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace, in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this, not, not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You may be seated. Kevin also said as we were preparing that if you can't preach through Ephesians, then you probably shouldn't be preaching. But when you look at this passage, it's, there's so much in here. And so just this is our spiritual story for those who know Christ, what we were before and what we are now. So if, in verse 1, he says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins. If I was to ask you this question, have you ever been dead? You would say, well, that's an odd question to ask. It's kind of confusing. Um, what kind of death are we talking about here? He says, you were dead previously. Um, in Revelation to the church of Sardis, this verse says, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. So how can you be alive but dead? In Luke 15, the story of the prodigal son says, For this son of mine was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. But if we know that story, he, the son wasn't actually dead. What kind of death are we talking about here? What is Paul talking about? Well, there's two kinds of life, and there's also two kinds of death. The first one is physical life. This is, we're all very conscious of it, but it's, there's also physical death. But there is also, the second form is spiritual life. And we may not be as conscious of spiritual life, but there is also spiritual death as well. And this is what Paul is talking about, this spiritual life, spiritual death. So how, how do you explain this? What does it mean to be spiritually dead? 
I was listening to a message by Charles Price and I found the, the way that he broke this down, I find it, found it very helpful and I'll, I pass it on to you. So these are not all original thoughts, but it's, it's helpful to understand, uh, it helped my understanding of this, this word that they were dead. <clears throat> so you and I are made up of three parts, our body, soul, and spirit. Um, there, there are some who believe that we're made up of two parts, that there's some kind of union between a soul and a spirit, that they're a similar thing, but um, I think in keeping with the New Testament or with uh, this Thessalonians 5 here, it says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I think there is a, he makes a distinction between those three parts here. So if we think of our body, that's the most obvious thing about us. That's what we see. We come in different shapes and sizes. Um, we feed ourselves, we dress ourselves, we put ourselves to bed, and it, it can sometimes feel like hard work taking care of your body. And I remember working with a coworker, and he would say in, in joking, will you please haul your carcass up here and give me a hand? But sometimes it can feel like that, where we're carrying around this body um, of us. So that's the first part, but we also have a soul. This is the life that inhabits the body. Um, we are aware that we have a soul. We feel like inside of us, we, we are living in, like we're living inside of our body, but like we're aware of that. Um, but we make it a high priority to make sure that our soul and our body don't separate. Um, because if, if that happens, uh, your relatives will take your body and put it in a box and they'll gather around and put the box in a hole, right? And we, we don't want that to happen. So we have a body and a soul. But we also have a spirit. And this might be the part that we're least familiar with. Um, but this is the part that God... When he created us, he gave us all three parts, but it gave us his spirit as well. This is a part that uh, is uniquely human. It's uh, what sets us apart from animals. We ask, we ask questions that are outside of ourselves, things like, where, where did I come from? Where am I going? What is the meaning of life? Why do I want fries with that? These philo philo philosophical questions that we ask, um, that are outside of ourselves. Um, this is how we are made up. And this is not, the spirit portion of us is not just specifically for believers, but it's human, human life um, in general. In, in Romans, it, it talks about that, uh, we are, that all men are without excuse because God has revealed himself to creation. What Though some people don't believe, it's because they're suppressing the truth. But within, they have the spiritual capacity to, to know or ask the questions. They may not have the answers, but they can at least ask the questions. So that's human life. If human life is broken down into these three parts. But God also created three different kinds of life. And this was by design. In, our, in everything that God did in creation, he, he specifically design things in a way that he could teach us about himself. So when we think of these three forms, we have plant life, animal life, and human life. Plant life being, we recognize that trees are alive, but this is just the form of body. They don't have a soul, they don't have a spirit, it's just a tree. You don't interact with a tree, or you shouldn't. Um, but we, it's just purely physical life. But we also have animal life. Animals have a body and a soul. And if you Google that, you get, on, without fail, on every website, there's a picture of a small child holding a rabbit or a bunny or petting their dog or, like, these nice pictures that we like. But animals do have a soul because they, um, they, have, they experience things that we do as well, things like mind or emotion or, or will. If you... If you shut your cat outside, he'll try to get back in, like he has a will. Um, they're also, animals do think, and some think better than other animals, but they, but they do think. 
but then human life and this um, as the unique component to human life is this third aspect of, of the spirit. Again, this spiritual capacity to know and experience God. So just keep these things in mind as we think about, um, as we talk about this, this spiritual life and spiritual death. This is how God made us uniquely human. So in Genesis um, chapter 2 with Adam and Eve, it says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of the tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in, in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And we know the story that, of what happened. When they ate of the tree, did they die? Did God come and find them physically dead underneath the tree? Well, no. But... Uh, they didn't physically die, but spiritually, when they ate of the tree, they died. You see, the, it wasn't just a, an immediate physical death, but um, though that, that process started as well, physically from that point, they started dying. And that's what um, this phrase, you shall surely die, it's, um, there's kind of, it says die, die, or dying you shall die, was the, was the Hebrew terms or how it would be translated. But Paul describes this state later in Ephesians as being separated from the life of God. That spiritual life that was inside of them, that died. They were separated from God when they sinned. Um, and this became a state that they passed on to all of humanity. Each one of us then is born in this state, separated already. And that's why Paul here can say, um, and you were dead. This is what we've inherited from, from Adam and Eve. And we read in Romans 5, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For the wages of sin is death, and that is present tense. Not that one day you will but die, but that you are already dead separated from God. This is our condition, a state of spiritual death, the state that you and I were born into. That's why Paul starts this biography um, in this way. Believer or unbeliever, all humanity is born into, into this state, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. So what is the result of this? Let's keep, keep reading. Verse 2. In which you once walked, following the course of this world, because you were dead, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom you all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. This is where that leads. If I remember in Bible school, our professor or teacher on, on Ephesians um, he said over and over, repeated this phrase, that dead does dead. There is nothing that a dead person can do. Everything that they try to do is just death. There's, there's nothing. That's, these are what happens to, what naturally occur to someone who is dead. They follow the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. They have a spirit of disobedience, carrying out the desires, gratifying the sinf sinful nature, this makes sense. This is all that you can do when you are in that state. <clears throat> so if we think about those illustrations that we're using of, of plant life, animal life, and human life, God as well, when he, <clears throat> when he created these things, he, he created for each one of them a governing force that would help them know how to live or the right way to survive. So again, this is from Charles Price, what he was illustrating, but plant life, when God created plants, he gave them the governing force for plants is seasons. So in Genesis, it says, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. 
These are the conditions necessary for plant life to function. That's why we have seasons, day and night. You can manipulate these things a little bit here and there, but essentially if, if you have too much of this or too little of it, that, that life will die, right? So if you can overwater a plant, you can kill it by giving it something that it needs. You can also, a plant will die when it doesn't get enough as well. I remember work, working for a guy who owned a greenhouse and he would, he would come around at 4.30 or 5 o'clock and he'd say, I'm gonna put my plants to bed. But what he was doing is he was manipulating their, their days. He would shorten their days to get the most production out of them. But he said, you have to be careful. You have to find your rhythm because if you push them too hard, they'll die, right? And this, but this is what God built into plant life was um, the governing force for plants was seasons. In the same way for animals, animals have something that is, is called instinct. Instinct was the govern, is the governing force that uh, animals just, they know what to do. And it's amazing. We see that um, the Bible gives us some examples. In Jeremiah, it says, even the stork in the heavens knows her times. The turtle dove, the swallow, the crane, they keep their time coming, the time of their coming. But my people know not the rules of the Lord. Why is it that migrating birds know exactly where to go and what to do, but humans don't? In Proverbs, it says, go to the ant, you sluggard, O oh, sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief, officer, or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in the harvest. Ants are amazing. In, in Zambia, if you would flick over an anthill, immediately ants would come up out of the ground and they would start building or working or, or fixing it. They each had a job and it was it was kind of comical. They would start building and you could flick it again and then they would come back. But they don't complain. They just, they all have their job and they know exactly what to do. They would work together. They'd travel in big lines and they'd, you'd see them going, going both directions, carrying food to and from, and they're all working together. This is by instinct. This was the governing force that God put within them so that they could function properly. But what about humans? What is the governing force to be in our lives? I'd say it's this, you may be tempted to think that seasons are a major governing force in certain people's lives. And if you were to use my parents as an example, you, you might be tempted to think that. You will know that it, is Janu that it is January on the first Sunday in January when mom and dad are not here. You don't have to look at a calendar either to know when it's May. When it's May, they will be back. But this isn't the governing spiritual force in, in humanity. The, the force itself is, uh, is spiritual life. When God created human beings, he placed his own spirit in them to be the, the means of governing um, so that they would know how to live and how to behave. So if we take these three examples, if we take seasons away from plants, they die. If we take instincts away from an animal, it won't know what to do, and it will die. And if we take the spiritual life away from, from a human life, they will die, or they're in the state of being dead, because they will not know what to do or how to function properly. And you may think that, or some people in this world would argue that, well, that's, that's fine. I don't mind being dead. I know that one day I'm going to die and I'll, I'm just going to just go. It doesn't, you know, there is no meaning to life. I can just carry on. It doesn't matter. But is that true? Does it matter? Well, it actually gets worse. You see, what we do isn't our real problem. It's what we are. This spiritual state that we are dead creates this separation from God. It's not just about trying to modify our behavior or become a better person. If you are spiritually dead, you, you don't have the capacity to, to do anything that is good. It does matter because as we keep reading here in verse 3, It says, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind 
and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. It says, under children of wrath, under the wrath of God. And this is what our world or people who say that often don't consider, that they are under the wrath of God. We don't like to talk about wrath very much. We'd much prefer to think of God's love and his kindness and his grace, those kinds of things. But those, those very attributes that we love to talk about God are the reason that God has wrath or anger stored up. Um, the fact that he is just and right is the reason that he is angry or has wrath. It's a righteous anger towards sin. It's, it's demanded because of his character, because of who he is. Um, if I'll illustrate this, if, if there was a, a judge and um, the person in front was, had committed a, a serious crime and the judge says, or it's very clear that the person had committed that crime, but the judge says, you know what, I know you're guilty, but I'm a loving judge, I'll let you go free. Is that, you would say that that judge is more wicked than the person who committed the crime because he's, he's allowed, being loving is not, it's not this wishy-washy kind of love that God has, but it's this, this love that demands justice and righteousness and therefore there is wrath. And this is our natural state, children of wrath, objects of wrath. And God's wrath is in two parts. It's, it's being revealed a little bit now, but it will be re revealed fully in, in the future. Um, in Romans, as we are reading about being uh, separated from God or that they are without excuse, it says that part of God revealing his wrath on people is that he, he gave them up to their sinful desires or, or passions and he let them go into the, And you might think, how is that God's wrath? But where that, where that leads or he lets them do what they want to do and that, that is a form of his wrath. But wrath is also, it talks about God's wrath being stored up Romans 2 verse 5 says, But because of your hard heart and impotent heart, you are storing up for yourself wrath um, on that day of wrath when God's righteous judgments will be revealed. And this is a sobering thing to think about and to be talking about here. There is only one place that you are sheltered from the wrath of God. One place that you can turn and the theological word for this is propitiation. This is what we need, the turning away of God's wrath. It's one of the most important theological words that can help us understand what Jesus did on the cross. Um, in Romans 3 is probably one of the best examples of this. Romans 3, 23 to 26. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So Paul's diagnosis of, of every human life is this, that we were born dead, we were disobedient, and we were doomed. And I know Andy likes illustrations, so I think he'll like that, or he likes alliteration. Um, but this is past tense, this is where we all started. He has just finished saying that we are under God's wrath. We can't get any lower than this point. But when we read verse 4, there's a, these two words are some of the most wonderful words in the Bible as we think about it. Verse 4, but God. In this state of wrath that we were in, but God, being rich in mercy 
because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And this is the message of the gospel, that the solution to our sin, our spiritual death, is we need this life, this life of Christ. And it wasn't, it wasn't something that God, or it wasn't anything that, that we did, but God did even while we were in this state of death where we could not save ourselves, God intervened, these two words, but God. And there is a number of verses in the Bible where it says, but God, where he intervened into life situations and, um, and brought them out. What do dead people need? The only thing that a dead person needs is life. It's no good feeding a dead person, no good dressing a dead person up. Our first need is not that we were lost and we need to find our way on some spiritual journey. We're not just spiritually confused. Our first need is, wasn't that we're just wounded or sick and we need to be healed, though those are true. Our first need is that we were dead and we need to be raised to life. We cannot save ourselves. We can't bring ourselves back. But it says, and he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. So how does God make us alive? He makes us alive by giving us the spiritual life, by giving you Christ, his life, the life of Jesus Christ in you. Remember in the Garden of Eden when we were talking about Adam and Eve, the life that was lost was the life of God in them. But the life restored is the life of God, his presence in us. He made us alive with Christ. In John 14, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Not, I will show you the way. He didn't say, I will tell you what the truth is. He didn't say, and I will give to you life. But he said, I am the life. And that in 1 John, it says it like this. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. So how do we receive this life? It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. This is verse 8. Saved from the wrath of God, saved from a life of death. There's a chance to consider what Christ has done for you while you were still dead. It says, saved through faith. You see, faith is always rooted in an object, allowing that object to do something for you, something that you cannot do for yourself. And that's what it says. It says, and this, not of yourselves. You cannot save yourself. And, but your faith is only as good as the object in which you put your faith. And this is what Paul is is pointing them to the person of Christ. He is the only one who can shelter you from the wrath of God when you put your faith and trust in him. This faith is always rooted in a person, rooted in the person of Jesus Christ. And we can see that in this spiritual biography of what Paul has written. This is the message of the gospel. The outline of this passage that I've been using is very simple. Um, this is the spiritual biography of every believer the first point is this, that you were dead. Were dead. The second point is, but God. And the third point is, raised up. And we read what God did. He raised us up to new life. New life, and that was the heading that we started with as well, this new life individually. This is what we need. We were dead and we need to be made alive. But what do we do with this new life? It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, verse eight. 
And this, not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. If the result of spiritual death is disobedience, then the result of spiritual life is obedience to God. We can see that the result of being raised up with Christ, it says we're now pointed to or, or headed or redirected to good works which God prepared for us in advance to do. Remember those illustrations again. If it is seasons that allow plant life to function properly, if it's instincts that allow animals to know what to do and how to live and how to survive, and it's the spirit of God, the spiritual life that enables a human being to function properly, and we begin to be engaged in good works um, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And this is a, it's not a, snap a thing that happens but it's something that we work towards as the spirit of God lives in us and moves in us and directs us on how to live and how to carry on uh, with our lives Um, he is there to help us but that is the only way that we can function properly and as we look at the life of individuals that's what the church is meant to be made up of that's what the church is made up of is true believers that have this spiritual life inside of them that's the way that then when we come together we collectively can function together as a body and this is what paul is gonna speak on in the rest of chapter two here but how that works together together as as a church for we for it is god who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure this is from philippians And here it says, we are his workmanship. So just in closing, I want to listen to these words of Jesus. This is from John chapter 11, uh, where the story of Lazarus. But Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And he turned to Martha and said, Do you believe this? And by application we can turn, would Jesus turn to us and say, Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. This is the spiritual biography of your life, that you were dead, but God raised us up to this new life. New life individually, and we'll talk about new life corporately in the, the next time that we're together when Paul speaks. So that's, uh, why don't I close in prayer? Father, thank you for your son, for what he has done for us. And as we've read here in Ephesians of all the, of the state that we were in, that we were all dead in our trespasses and sins, we thank you that you intervened by sending your son. And as we transition into the Lord's Supper in the next meeting as well, we thank you that we can do that and have the opportunity to acknowledge him and what he's done for us. We thank, uh, we pray for this Ephesian study too as we continue on that your spirit would be at work in the hearts of, of us that we would know and experience God and have real life, real um, experience of, of you, of who you are. And uh, I just want to thank you for our time now. We pray that you would, Um, impress these truths on our hearts apply them where it's needed we all come from different circumstances and different backgrounds we just pray for this church family and the world around us as well in jesus name amen